Good morning. I hope everyone's well and safe. Uh, I'm Richard McClellan, uh, Sales Director at Advances. Welcome to our webinar today, which has been sponsored by 19 Events and is in conjunction with our technology partners, Zenitel and 36 Division. Today, we're going to be discussing um, the high level considerations when deploying. Um, scoping and designing an integrated management solution. This is broken out into four sections. The first covers just high level objectives when considering deploying such a solution. Then we'll lead into two specific subsystem technology examples when considering uh, advanced CC surveillance delivered by Tony Holloway and Mark Rainbow of 36 Division and the design and implementation of an IP critical communication system from Shell Luritsen of Zenitel. And then finally, what to consider when scoping an integrated management platform or PSIM type solution from Alan Dickinson of Advances. Uh, there is a Q&A section on the webinar control panel where you can ask questions throughout the duration. We will endeavour to answer as the presentations are being delivered. However, we'll also have a short Q&A section at the end where I'll facilitate some questions um, that have been asked by the audience to our subject matter experts. So when scoping any project, and this just doesn't apply to technology, um, we need to know the what, the why and the how. But first um, and foremost, it's important to really understand the why. What are the key factors driving a customer to consider the implementation of, of a PSIM or open integration platform? Risk is, is a big driver across our industry um, and many industries now. Are they looking to reduce risk and liability by increasing security or improving process? Compliance. Now, is this to adhere to compliance resulting from a change in legislation within their industry, or is it a change in internal policy and procedure? For example, enforcement of a new health and safety measures due to change in circumstances or environmental conditions quite prevalent at the moment with a lot of businesses changing policy and procedure around COVID-19. Cost, obviously a cost is a, is a huge driver across um, all industries and businesses. Is this the prime driver? If so, how do they believe this can be achieved? For example, have legacy systems become too labor intensive to maintain? Or do they wish to implement a more integrated solution to protect legacy systems and prevent the need for rip and replace? Two quite contrasting views. Ideally, it's a combination of all those three, which would really drive um, a big need for an integrated management solution. Every project should have a business case which evaluates and demonstrates the return on investment that can be achieved by increasing efficiencies due to the solution, enabling a reduction in resource, i.e due to having a single system for operation, consolidating multiple systems and reducing a resource in a control room, for example, down from 10 operators to maybe four due to a system change, enhancing the user and operator experience to drive efficiencies, i.e. using guided workflows to deal with events or alarms, for example, Digitization of um, manual processes such as SOPs. This will in turn enforce compliance and reduce time to serve. Uh, and hence, this streamlines process. And overall, this gives um, a return on investment. But it's very important to build that business case with the end user or the end user to do that, to understand what the key drivers are. Pre-project considerations. So we're just going to go over this at a very high level. Um, what are the pre-project considerations when deploying such a solution? Regulatory compliance. 
Again, this is different from internal compliance procedures, but this is when you've decided the regulations within your industry that you need to adhere to, and hence why you're considering such a system. What are the actual regulations surrounding that system, such as GDPR when holding customer data? Does it need to be um, NSI certified or CPNI, for example? Now, change management is such an important factor when deploying a new system, and it's, it is very often missed or under, underestimated by many organizations. For those who, who might not be fully aware, change management is an organization's approach to prepare individuals or teams when making organizational change. This can be across uh, changing goals, process, or technology. Now, reports claim that around 70% of all change initiatives actually fail. Failure then can reflect poorly on the technology being deployed when it actually isn't the case that it's not fit for purpose, but just there was no change management in plan in place. Uh, I tend to promote and have used uh, four simple steps as a framework when executing change. Um, the end users need to think carefully about how how you can promote a willingness to change and how to integrate employees uh, and management correctly. So step one can be creating the vision for change that you'd like to make. So really here we're identifying the problem we're solving. Again, it goes back to your drivers. And when people under, understand that problem you're solving, they're much more receptive to that change. Two, stakeholder and change impact analysis. So really, what you should not do under any circumstances, engaging with multiple stakeholders and creating a change impact analysis so that they're well aware of how that change will affect them or their department. Stakeholder activation and change advocates, communication is key here. Other people in the business need to buy into the vision that then will um, create a, a smoother adoption for change and then communications plan and strategy. So training, enablement, and tracking success and getting feedback constantly, not just from an initial assessment. Strategy development. So creating, a if it's security-based, a security strategy. Um, so research is really important and one that a lot of organizations, again, don't do enough of. So looking at other organizations who have deployed such a system, engaging with them, understanding um, what went right and what didn't go so well and how they dealt with change. Um, we need to look at stakeholder engagement and mapping, uh, operational and technical audits to scope requirements and processes. That's really important. Changes in policy and procedure and risk, threat, and vulnerability assessments, security needs assessments, due diligence reporting, the list goes on, security system design, you know, how are the subsystems and the management system gonna to integrate together and in the interoperability, protection of the legacy assets. And then if you're designing an ARC, for example, or a control center, the standard that that needs to adhere to, so BS5979, for example. Then we look at project and performance management, the designing of training programs adequately, testing, witness testing, penetration testing, physical and virtual, and then independent system sign off. So with all this in mind, there's, there's a lot to think about when integrating a system like this to ensure it's successfully deployed and scoped well and you choose the right system that will achieve the objectives that you're looking for. So we do hope that um, end users do engage a consultant to do this, whether that is internal or whether that's an external consultant. Um, that's very important when scoping a process like this to bring that expertise in and, and a, a small investment in a consultant uh, or a consulting firm can really pay dividends um, going forward. So that just gives you a high level overview of some of the considerations. So uh, I'm now gonna hand over to um, Mark Rainbow and Tony Holloway of 360 Division. Um, 
to talk to you about deploying considerations on advanced CCTV surveillance. So, Tony, Mark, over to you. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Rainbow, and I'm with my colleague, Tony Holloway, who will discuss some interesting design features to consider when specifying a camera solution for a project. Just a few words on 360 Vision technology before we get going. Since 2003, we have been manufacturing ruggedized camera solutions from our factory based in Runcorn, Cheshire, employing over 43 people. The next slide, Tony, if you would. This uh, slide here just shows a cross section of our camera solutions, ranging from integrated radar controlled cameras, dual view, cameras with long range lighting applications, thermal options out to two and a half kilometers, and our new TX range, which is five, four and 5G compatible. All our cameras are OnViv approved and certified to IP68, IK10 and cyber secure. Okay, Tony, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Well, we're going to take a look over these next three slides over the camera selection and what's to be considered when selecting a camera. And there are two main themes for this, one understanding what you need the camera to do and also understanding what the camera is capable of. So the very first thing on the top of the list is actually to have an operational requirement. And it's got to be said, if you don't have a clear understanding of exactly what you wish to achieve, you're never going to get the result that's desirable. So an operational requirement is the first step in scoping any camera selection. And this covers a very broad number of areas. So threat analysis is part of that. When you're putting CCTV system into a site, you have a reason for doing it, a reason for having this surveillance capability. So threat analysis, where is your threat coming from? what is your threat and how do you look to observe it and in part of that you really have this target classification so your target essentially your threat typically individuals could be vehicles could be other things airborne etc can be widespread um, but your target is really what you're now saying well okay this is the target that could appear how do i wish to see that uh, and there's quite a bit out there um, in the information base on the description of what that target is and how that target is best displayed on the CCTV system. So essentially that next part of this slide is describing, well, really how big should my target actually be on screen? Uh, and that can be defined in terms of someone actually viewing the screen and how large they need to be. But there's also a technical aspect as well, which is known really as pixels on target depending on what that target is a different number of pixels and there are various tools to enable you to measure this and that tends to be clarified as to whether you want to identify someone whether you're looking to recognize or just detect whether they're actually there there's also classification in terms of the amount of surveillance for certain sites so depending on what that actual site is there will be a classification to actually say well you need to be able to detect for a percentage area of the site, depending on what that site is used for. Moving on from that in terms of actually camera placement, there are other very good rules to really follow. One in particular in terms of blind spots, obviously if there's an area which uh, particularly blind to anyone on the site, make sure that that's not within your camera's field of view so you have everything covered. And also in terms of covering that surveillance asset, something which is often not considered. You can put a CCTV camera up, but really that needs to be covered by another so you can detect if anyone is approaching it from an area that might not be, be seen. And also combining that in with existing assets that are on site as well and how additional cameras may interact with systems and cameras that are already available on site. So the next areas of consideration are really about the functionality of the cameras itself. Of course, the form factor, very important. Am I looking at a camera that's going to be in a fixed location or do I need it to actually get a move around and zoom in and observe other 
areas. And this will be very dependent, of course, on where the camera is actually placed. And again, on its operational requirement, if it needs to be observing an area 100% of the time. You're then looking at how you're going to mount that camera, a particular such as the structure it's going on to, the wind loading effects, and whether it really needs to see in all directions. So typically with a pan and tilt camera, if it's on a column, remote away from a building then it really needs that 360 degree view capability you then have your environmental considerations not only in terms of the weather and the harsh environments from the that Im impact and the ingress of protection for the actual unit but temperature ranges as well so vast consideration to be had there which will guide you in terms of the construction materials and particularly the paint finish and that actually even goes on to whether you want the system to be overt so it's obvious that it's there or really to blend into the surroundings where i need the system but i don't want it to appear to be a blot on a building i want it to blend in so those that are looking for cctv will see it but perhaps the general public it won't spoil their view of the uh, location furthermore looking at landscape looking at the uh, limitations of the fields of view hills and valleys etc that may need to be recovered can affect the number of cameras that are going to be required furthermore vulnerability of where the camera could be of course you're actually looking at finding targets there's no point of putting a camera in an area where it could be vulnerable but if it is in an area where people could possibly get to it again the design of that camera and the fact that it would be able to put up with that perhaps someone actually physically getting hold of it is a very important consideration we're then moving further on to the power requirement. Perhaps it needs to be off grid. There isn't power in the location. So it's low power requirements will also be a strong consideration. And certainly not least, maintenance plan. Be able to get to the camera to perform maintenance is a very important aspect and a responsibility you would have in designing any system as to where the cameras would actually be. So our third slide on this list of camera selection and overview is really about the capability of the video and more slides in this presentation are gonna focus more on, well, how capable is the camera and how does it work in terms of the visual, visual thermal, where the two cameras in one head may be required, support illumination, be that IR or black light or white light, and how far can that really go? What is acceptable? What can I expect um, to be achieved from my surveillance solution? There could also be some secondary considerations for the requirement of a camera. So your primary could be looking down a fence line, but perhaps having it as a pan and tilt rather than thermally, when there is an issue on site, perhaps an intruder, having the ability to move the cameras around off their primary area to look into site and away to site, and maybe at some distance away from site as people flee from a, from a scene, could also be a strong consideration. This really leads into integration capability with the control system and having the ability not only to be able to move the camera around in terms of pan and tilt and zoom, but also control some of the automated functions and override those should they be required, such as turning on the white lights, should you wish that, as well as things like wiper and washer control, and maybe even down to health monitoring. Now, these next few slides, we're going to look at some of the video capability, and what we have done here is really taken a series of video shots, but for the purpose of the webinar, done them as still frames. So you can actually focus in on the key points um, that we have with the, uh, the video. So this first one is showing us the range examples. Now we talked about specific range in terms of identifying a target and things like that. We touched on a little earlier in the, the slide, but here's some examples. I think, well, what does at 200 meters a target look like? So we can show that here where we've actually gone to, well, the beach, um, quite topical. Uh, this point it's Burnham on Sea, and then we've actually pitched at various different locations. There's the wide angle view from the camera, and you can see it's a rather nasty day, not untypical. And leaden sky, and in the distance in the center of the image there, we have a couple of gentlemen that are holding up a sign. So now we've actually zoomed into them. They are at 200 meters, and you can get an idea of how large they are. And for good measure, we have a canine in view as well, and some birds in the background. Now, if we move on to 300 meters, we can see, obviously they're reducing in size, but still identifiable. And we take it further and further where we're going on to the 400 meters. And we take it to 500 meters, which is almost at the uh, wooden lighthouse, which is down on Burnham-on-Sea. So it gives you an idea 
where 500 meters would be. Um, this is an example of 800 meters, slightly zoomed in here, and the yellow box on the screen is where our 800 meter targets are. And if I show you that image, we're fully zoomed in, and that's around about our 800 meters. And you can see they're about 10% of screen height, so you're just within the detection of a 1.7 meter target at that particular distance. So let's put this into a slightly more random context. And at 125 meters, we have a couple of individuals. And if we zoom into those two individuals on, on screen, you'll see they're about 50% of screen height here. And if they were facing the camera, you'd be able to identify them, I'm quite sure. And we'll move on now to looking at the lighthouse, which we saw just a moment ago, but a close up on the lighthouse, which is 540 meters away. And again, hopefully you can see you're very easily picking out all the definition on the lighthouse as we see it there. So that's really covering off uh, particular distances that are quite close to the actual camera. So let's just put this in perspective. I could be protecting a site, looking at things are further away. What sort of capability can I expect? So here's the wide angle view looking the other way up the, the beach. And we've got some yellow boxes because I'm going to cycle through some of the video footage here as stills, which shows what we can see at these distances. So at 280 meters, we're looking at those flats. Um, quite clearly, we can see those on screen. Uh, a little bit further, almost at 600, we can clearly see the flag above the church tower and the, the weather vane being capturing a bird in full flight at the top there. A little bit further, we have some workers at 750 meters. And slightly prior to that, there is a CCTV camera for those uh, that are eagle eyed. Uh, and as you'd expect, that's a, a predator camera for 360 vision. Um, a little further on, 825 meters, uh, longing for the chip shop to be open. Um, and then we can see it there, 825 meters and some individuals in the forefront, but almost getting ridiculous over a kilometer away is where the amusements are on the far side of the pier. Talking of ridiculous in terms of distance, because of where we are, Hinkley Point Power Station is not too far away. It's 10 kilometers away. Um, that's it in the distance. Now, this is a very muggy day. So it's not a, a super location. If we're here on a, on a clear day, it would be yeah, outstanding. But still, with these results and some image enhancement on the actual products, we can see the uh, Hinkley Point Power Station at uh, over 10 kilometers away. Another example of that distance is here. Um, the camera location is again over 10 kilometers away, six and a half miles from the M1. And there's a gantry sign of the uh, M1. We normally run this as, as a piece of video. And in the center of the screen there, we are 30 times optical, three and a half times digital, which is why this is digital uh, signal that's on screen. And then in the center is the gantry. But we'll just zoom wide a little bit more from that. And you can see it's in the center of the screen now. That's the, the full HD image. But if I come all the way wide, you know, where you were, you can't actually see now because of the haze and the mist that was in that particular area. So the image enhancement feature is really useful there and be able to pick out what you could be looking for in the far distance. So that's some daytime footage of seeing what's going on. But how about nighttime? So here's a location really for test purposes where we can look across a number of fields and the edges of the fields are some nice clean markation points. So we've got the 230 meters, we've got 500 meters. And so if we actually put a camera at the edge of the field, we've got a nice green field where this was actually taken. And we can see that's our 230 meter point. And this is obviously in the daytime. But the reason we're doing this is for nighttime footage with support IR illumination. So how far can you go with the illumination? So if we were to zoom into those trees in the daytime at 230 meters, there they are nice and clear. So let's take a look at nighttime. So we can now see that there's a spread of our illumination on this, this medium range, as we can see here. It takes us almost up to 230 meters with a wide angle, uh, but beyond that, virtually pitch black. So as we zoom in, which is the next uh, slide, we've taken it into the trees. Because we zoom into the trees, we put additional uh, illumination on, so we can clearly see those at 230 meters without any issue whatsoever. If we go uh, somewhat beyond that, here's an example. So we're looking across several fields now. That's our 230 meter point. And now we've got 475, so almost 500 meters into the next field. 
where there's an old barley crop there. And if we zoom in even further, the IR illumination is capable of actually giving us some imagery back to the camera. And essentially, we're almost catching the, the field beyond that, which is 750 meters away. So that's IR illumination. Well, how about white light? And we don't see so much white light in, in security, but we, we have that capability of having the white light on, often in short range, but there's long range capabilities as well. So we're back to Burnham on the sea. We're on that horrible day here as well. We stayed there until late in the evening. And the yellow box on the screen is where this next still frame is from at night, zoomed in without any support illumination. And so we're forced to the camera in color rather than monochrome so we can uh, see the, the point here and you can see it's quite a noisy image yes we can see the street lights etc but when i turn the white light on we'll be able to see it about the sort of 150 to 200 meter mark there's a couple of individuals right there uh, by that pole in the actual sand of course we're using white light we can immediately pick out oh, hello they've got green boots got jeans on blue jacket etc uh, rigger boots on the other gentleman that's there so we can immediately start picking out information with that white light throwing out that area just so you have an idea of what that looks like as far as the products concerned that's a, a photograph um, which has been enhanced in terms of the light so you can see that the white light beaming out from the top and the bottom of that predator camera so our, our next example is really real world and this is the hqs wellington which is moored on the uh, the river Thames. And we have a camera mounted on top of uh, this uh, vessel, and it gives us the uh, the ability to not only demonstrate, but of course, it's also useful for their their purposes. And so, to the right hand side of this image, that's a picture of a predator with uh, long range IR lighting on board, and you can see we've got the Millennium Wheel in the foreground there. So, some images from this camera by uh, comparison. So that's the camera looking downstream. So we can see the camera there. And if we look upstream, there's the view from the camera as well. So the, the next piece of footage we're gonna go for is really looking at this camera at night. So that's the camera physically mounted on the HQS Wellington and our focus is gonna be 300 meters away on a pontoon where they moor up some of the, uh, the river cruise boats, et cetera, that, that spend their time going up and down the Thames. So this next bit of footage is all still frames um, so we're at night we're wide angle there's ambient light around we can get some color images quite easily from here as we start to zoom in towards that pontoon which is this, this next slide um, again there's ambient light so we can see what's going on but we're focusing in in the center there on what is a, a blue container and so now we've zoomed in quite a long way we can still see the container we can see what's actually going on there but the next level of zoom is really increasing the f-stop on the camera to a point where we're just not getting enough light in. So we're not seeing enough. So in this application where typically we wouldn't need any IR support illumination, we've got an application here where we do need to see it if we want to see what's going on in that pontoon. So even putting the camera into monochrome, not getting a huge lot more coming back out of it. But as soon as I turn on the spot IR illumination, we're lighting up that area, no trouble at all. 300 meters away from the camera and we just pan to the right we've got another view there of the the cruise boat you can see we we'll see what's actually going on we can then employ some image enhancement now of course these are things that you do on the fly so they'll be done from the control system by selecting these particular things by the operator or could be automated if you're going around to preset positions and you're observing particular areas that need this additional enhancement to enable you to see as we pan out from this area you can see because the ir illumination is now on that's all lit up in the center and as i zoom out completely that's now turned off and i can switch the camera back here with its monochrome mode without any ir illumination and then i can drop it back into color so it's giving an example there a real world example of that camera in operation you're using a different controls to see what it's actually capable of and doing some distance so this final set we're going to look at is well, where's thermal come in? So the camera location here is mounted looking across Loch Ness. And we're looking at the far bank, which is 1.4 kilometers away from the camera. That's a still image of the visual camera in the daytime zoomed into that far bank. And if I was to pan out these next shots, so we're, we're coming out from where it was, we're zooming out. And it's once I've gone fully wide, we can then see 
across the lock, we can see some green area around some trees. So that's our daytime shot, as you'd expect, uh, very, very capable. Let's take a look at nighttime. So we've got some IR illumination just lighting up the local area there. We can start to zoom in as to where we were going to the far bank. But straight away, what we're actually seeing here is the fact we're lighting up the trees, we're lighting up the area, but there is zero reflection coming off the water. There's nothing coming back to the camera. Doesn't matter how much illumination we put out there, it's not going to help. So this is where thermal will come in and certainly assist in this scenario. So if I show you the, from the thermal camera exactly at the same time, of course, now we're picking out the water without any problem at all. Now, this is a black hot image using thermal. And there's some black dots on the very far bank that the camera is actually uh, picking out. Let, let's put that into context in looking at a, a slightly more familiar image. So this is looking back onto what is the, uh, the campsite, monochrome image. And there's a center there, we have our, our yellow box on the screen, which is where the thermal camera is going to be. And if I now select that thermal camera image, you can just see how much is now available to the thermal camera. So it really gives you so much more, particularly at night in terms of picking out the temperature range. And you'll see on the screen there is a series of little black dots lying around on the grass. And of course, they are rabbits. As everyone's tucked up in their motorhomes here, they will come out to uh, mooch around. So hopefully that's been useful in terms of showing some examples of some capability of products with respect to meeting essentially an operational requirement. And that's really what it comes back to where we started. It's absolutely key to ensure that your effective solution meets that operational requirement and you clearly put that together. Just a small point, of course, these video examples which have been seen, they're stills from video. They're all live video footage. There's no frame integration happening with those. So we just took those stills, hopefully to make it easier just to put those across the webinar. And they were all from 360 Vision Technology products. So on that, I will hand you back to Richard. Thank you, Tony and Mark. Uh, that was great. There, there is a couple of questions come in, but I'll um, I'll save those for for the end when we do the Q and A section. But yeah, that was really good and insightful. Um, so I'll now hand over to um, Shell from Zenitel uh, on considerations when designing uh, an IP communication system. Shell, over to you. Thank you, Richard. So I'm uh, really happy to be a part of this um, uh, this session. Uh, my name is uh, Kjell Magne Larsen. Um, I come from Senitel, um, and uh, I represent Senitel HQ in Norway, uh, and I uh, am the area sales manager for Nordics and the UK. So uh, we'll be running through some um, uh, considerations when uh, designing a system for audio uh, for airports as a case. Uh, and I hope that that will give an interesting um, uh, view upon uh, audio for for uh, for security environments. Um, short story about Senitel. Uh, we've been doing communication products and solutions for more than 70 years, um, and we see that there's a huge change in how the communication has been uh, in, been evolving throughout all these years. Um, we have actually uh, said that we do intelligent communication and what that actually means is that um, uh, we see that um, um, it's, it's the marriage of unified, unified communication with business application, workflows and data and the driving force is really the application integrations, artificial intelligence and analytics and how security systems can connect and interact. Uh, so it's, we see that uh, audio in general is, is, is becoming much more pervasive uh, and we think that soon we will be surrounded by intelligent audio devices and uh, since we are a manufacturer of intercoms and IP network speakers, uh, that plays a big part of it. And all these devices are getting also smarter and smarter and are being fed by big data and input from other security systems in our, uh, in our uh, business. And also, they, they are getting much more easier to deploy, maintain, and use. Yeah, our vision is to be the world leading provider of intelligent uh, communication. And we strive to, to give you the highest quality of audio products in the market being available. Um, 
that is a constant development being made, uh, both on the hardware side, on the software side, and also on the mechanics used inside. And we're looking at how, how we can actually design and set up a system in this particular case for airports uh, as a case. Uh, so we believe that uh, <clears throat> the ability to hear, be heard and understood every time in any location, anywhere, is very important rather than it being an airport, a building security site, or a shopping mall, or whatever site you, you might be uh, looking at audio for. <clears throat> so when looking closer into airports uh, and safety, um, communication, as I said, plays a big part of it. And what considerations you should be making is to look at the actual environment. Uh, typically for airports, it's very crowded. Many people there, uh, you got a lot of travelers, uh, you got a lot of stress, and uh, obviously that creates a lot of background noise. Um, there are also many locations like parking, terminal, um, control tower, and the runway. And in those areas, uh, you would also find a typical case of, of a lot of background noise, and that also calls for uh, intelligible audio, so you'll be able to communicate uh, efficiently and to, to hear what's being said. Um, and also you should be looking at the users, um, which people are going to use the system, uh, what communication needs does the travelers have, and what communication needs are important for the staff, uh, what other communication systems do they use, should there be an integration between those uh, different uh, uh, communication systems, do they use any other uh, security systems and should that be integrated? Uh, what will be the best operation for this setup? Um, and that also will determine if we should have an integration or not, uh, or a separate system. And we also see that both travelers and staff uh, have a lot of need for information. They need to stay informed in any situation. They need to be able to communicate and they also need to be protected uh, in case of any incidents. So uh, we got this 360 uh, perspective on, on audio and how that really uh, incorporates into the security setup. So how we actually look upon this is, and that also calls especially for airports in particular, um, what is important to consider is that for the 360 perspective, um, you will be see that there is a lot of uh, benefits when you look at integrational possibilities between the systems. So we see that um, being able to, to see and to listen, to inform, and to be able to communicate due to any situation is very important. And that is the role also audio plays. So if you detect something on the video surveillance system, uh, like uh, uh, 360 vision presented, um, you should be able to communicate in any incident, uh, which will be much more efficient than calling a security guard, which, which will spend yeah, some minutes and maybe up to 15 minutes before he or she will be able to arrive to the scene. So you can actually address the situation immediately. So what you could do is that you could have different events between the systems. So if you, let's say you use video analytics, then we can create an event in our system that can play a pre-recorded uh, message to address the specific uh, situation immediately. And then maybe you have an access control system, but most likely you will do. Um, we also can, uh, can deliver secure door opening, um, uh, um, set up into the access control system, uh, rather than just depending on the relay inside the intercom units uh, as a safer operation for controlling the doors and the barriers. And obviously for PCM systems like the WinGuard for, from Advances, which can be the overall um, security management system that can actually also receive all the video calls, uh, video intercom calls from our system and then also open up doors uh, and other zones that needs to be addressed. So it, it's just an, an interesting and important consideration uh, when you discover the possibilities of 
adding an integration into the security mix. Uh, there's a lot of a huge range of different stations from, from both Senatel and also other manufacturers that you, you might consider. So uh, <clears throat> there is a possibility to, to consider um, what kind of uh, special purpose station you should be using. Uh, we manufacture both in IP intercom stations, uh, IP network speakers, uh, and also special purpose station like the industrial one you see there. Uh, we support, for instance, um, ONWIF, so it makes it easy to integrate into a video management system when you want to have the video stream coming from the turbine, the video intercom station. Um, there's many ways you can integrate. You have, we support OPC, SDK, um, but we can also do uh, uh, standard I/O signaling, whatever needed. Uh, so that's that's also some of the important things to to look into. Um, when we look at the intelligent communication um, uh, devices, um, then uh, why audio quality is so important is that I addressed and stressed that um, during any situation you don't want to have any. Uh, travelers or staff being locked inside rooms and not being able to get out of those rooms and communicate. Uh, it can be noisy and you need to have a proper uh, communication system uh, that can deliver high quality audio. And also interoperability um, is an important consideration rather than uh, being not being able to integrate because you might uh, want to get everything connected. And then you need to consider how large is this system going to be? Uh, is it going to be one or two stations or are you going to be integrated into different sites? Um, so we have at least a very scalable system that makes it possible to connect, uh, for instance, several airports into one single system. Uh, as one example, in Norway, for instance, we have 46 airports because of the complex, complexity in topology and, and geography. So the, the possibility is that the, the airports far up north can possibly connect with the airport in Oslo, for instance. And of course, uh, IT also calls for uh, very strict IT requirements these days. So we see that cybersecurity is becoming more and more important. Um, and we are a member of the CIS organization and we also have a hardening guide for you. Uh, which um, have a lot of good guidelines in what considerations you should make when you set up uh, an audio system on your network. That can also be downloaded from senatel.com or we can send it to you if you want. So this is a typical example for an airport uh, as a case uh, for this presentation. Um, we yeah, there are many many different ways we can uh, and zones we can we can deliver communication but we one example is for the baggage handling um, you might have people who needs to know if the baggage is stuck or missing they can just push the button for instant help uh, rather than being confused and not knowing where to go um, you might have uh, police present at the airport where you have the custody and some people needs to be put in custody and, and you need vandal resistant station. So you will have some kind of a communication with the detainees um, at the custody. And also for parking, um, for parking areas, uh, we de deliver a lot of uh, kits uh, which are being installed on the backside of the front plate of the parking barriers and also the parking vending machines. Uh, so we get HD audio quality uh, when speaking in those areas. And there also audio quality is very important because of the noise from the cars. And it's, uh, it's, it's very crucial, actually. We also supply automatic volume adjustments. So there's a, if there's a huge difference between the engine noise from the car and the truck, for instance, uh, we will be able to adjust the volume level accordingly. And then for control towers, you might set up speed dial buttons, for instance, unless you want to use uh, an operation control center on the top right uh, as uh, the PSM system from WinGuard, as one example, to communicate throughout the whole system. Uh, and same as for lifts, as for parking, um, where you want to use kits inside the lift. So we'll have a complete audio solution for the whole system rather than having separate system. That's only one system to maintain. 
that rather than having uh, several other systems to maintain. So that also saves a lot of operational costs. And also for the security officers who might uh, walk around with um, uh, two way radio, we can actually integrate those two way radios into our system, uh, being able to send them pre recorded messages if there is a security breach somewhere, or send uh, yeah, talk directly from the control room, for instance, or directly from the, the, the wind guard system. Um, for the doors and entrances, um, that's very common. Um, just yeah, consider just how many different locations uh, are needed to call. If you need one or two buttons, you need multiple buttons, for instance. You have the check-in gates where we have gooseneck microphones that makes it able to integrate with uh, uh, both uh, a voice alarm system or PA systems, for instance. Uh, so we just have one single device to communicate with all different zones. Uh, depending on it being intercoms or a PA system. And of course, the passenger help points where people can potentially get stuck. And I think Tony from 360 Vision had a good point that make sure that you don't get any blind spots. And that also uh, counts for the same when it comes to intercoms. Make sure that you don't have any blind spots where people are stuck so they're not, not able to get help anymore. So. Um, we have this case study for, for Oslo Airport. Um, so what we delivered here is, um, that's like the main uh, airport in, in Norway. Um, so as I said, we have 46 airports. So we, are, we have been delivering to a lot of those airports, but what we have delivered specifically for Oslo is a custom made control room panel for the control tower. Uh, so they are able to communicate with other control towers um, and uh, discuss weather reports or whatever it might be that concerns the, the operation of the airport. Uh, you have uh, help points in, inside different sluices. Uh, that's where the sluices, uh, where you have the doors closing when you get off the plane. So if people get stuck inside, they're able to get help immediately. And obviously there's a lot of door intercoms for staff and travelers to make sure that, that people will always be able to reach someone if they need help. And for the parking areas, we also have intercoms for the parking machines. And in this case, uh, we in fact delivered those intercoms as SIP devices connected to the customer's IPBX. Uh, but we also have our own server, uh, which makes it more possible to integrate uh, as we talked about in the introduction of this presentation. So that's like an important consideration for the design setup. Uh, should we use the existing server being an IPBX? Or would we, would we like to have a more integrated solution where we need to apply a more, a better security gateway for those operations? Yeah, so with that, I would just like to say thank you very much for participating into this webinar. And uh, if you do have any questions, please feel free to ask. You might also be able to go to senatel.com to see more about uh, our solutions. Uh, so with that, I would like to give my words over to Richard. Thank you, Shell. That was great. Thank you. Um, yeah, a couple of questions have come in. Uh, again, I'll, I'll field those until the end. So now for the, the final section before we go to the Q&A um, from Alan Dickinson of Advances. So this will cover sort of how that will all come together and considerations when designing and implementing uh, an open integration management system. Alan, over to you. Cheers, Rich. Thank you very much. I'll just grab control. Excellent. Okay, so as I said, my name is Alan Dickinson. So here's just a little bit about uh, my background in relation to my experience working in the uh, PSIM open integration industry, uh, ranging from virtually everything from technical sales all the way through to product management and working as part of senior management teams within businesses uh, that develop PSIM. So moving on. Um, one of the most important questions or one of the strangest questions that I, I like to ask um, as part of any uh, design 
is is open integration really really for you is it the right choice for you um and i think you can start to ask questions based around that so just because it's the common choice doesn't always make it the right choice and to to understand that if you're looking for features i guess that are basic features such as video wall management simple event management access intruder analytics events uh, exporting of video cctv control and simple recording capabilities then really there there are other integration options so there there are options such as vms sms a high-end access control systems that can still deliver some basic integration and give you a number of features um, that you'll be able to use um, however if if you are starting to look for features such as automating responses to events and intelligent event stacking event incident and kpi reporting data maintaining legacy equipment and investment and ensuring legacy compatibility whilst moving forward then a pcm an open integration platform however you prefer to refer to it is probably the right choice but it's just good to ensure that we're making the right choice and not just going uh, with with open integration because it's the common choice within the market and it's what everybody else is doing so once you've decided that open integration is what you require there are a number of outline considerations that you should make so what are the outputs um that you um that you would like to get from the system what are the data issues integration issues security issues connectivity issues and the objectives so to to really just cover a couple of these if we start with objectives what is the objective this has already really been discussed by richard right back at the start of the webinar um, and on the previous slide as we've said if you de define clearly the objectives if you don't define the objectives clearly you may not end up with a solution that you're really 100 percent happy with so moving on from that what are the outputs it may seem a strange comment and not necessarily the place you would normally think to start but defining the outputs of the system early are really the key to success next what are the data considerations um so what are the data considering data management issues what data needs to be collected and how can you manage this data efficiently integration so what third party systems would you like to integrate and how to maybe think outside the box as to what is possible rather than just kind of cameras access control etc uh, from a security point of view from a security point of view um, what is required for your site and what are the important things to consider from a connectivity considerations, we're going to look at how all of this tech will connect back together and make some and, and understand that sometimes you shouldn't just make assumptions based on based on what you believe. Um, so these are the most important things that we're going to cover. However, I will dig into a few other things around looking at the manufacturer as a whole. Um, and there are other things that we won't have time to cover um, in today's presentation with the time that we have. However, there are other things like looking at systems that you've seen or used in the past, what you didn't like, what you should try and look to avoid with a new implementation, such as specific features or high ongoing revenue costs, et cetera. And also what you could achieve from the conver convergence of technology. So with all the new technology appearing on the market all of the time where could you expand your thinking and maybe embrace some of the new technology but we we won't have time to cover all of that in in today's presentation but some things to think about so one of the most important parts of the design process should be to define what outputs you would like to get from the system and by this i do not mean outputs from an integration to say open a door or open a door but rather the data uh, open a door or switch a camera or something like that but rather the data outputs that you expect uh, based on the system that you're going to connect so if you expect detail coming out of the system such as uh, enhanced traceability from the system with an event and clarity and transparency on the performance of the system then this could you know include 
this all of this could include data such as the time to respond to events the type of events the number of open events it could also relate to performance data such as server temperatures and cpu performance dependent on what environment the system is about to be implemented in and all of this really needs to be presented as you'll see on the screen in some form of kpi or data dashboard with some automated scheduled reporting and multi-format potentially exportable reports as well so to achieve all of this you need to and get all of this data out in the way that you want it presented then deciding what your outputs are early is really is really definitive in the process to designing an open integration system and also once you've defined that that and they're in order you need to then get this next part right also so the next part um, and to meet the objectives uh, what data needs to be collected in, in order to make the outputs that we've just discussed possible and how are you going to manage that data so to achieve this, you will need to ensure the data you captured is defined very, very clearly. So have event inc incident slash event reporting that is configurable enough to collect all of the data and not just fixed data sets. So you want to be able to define the data that you're collecting um, using dynamic workflows, et cetera. Ability to generate other events via manual or automated triggers to capture data events such as maintenance events, et cetera, et cetera. So you should also have a clear and concise plan on how you're going to manage your data. So having the ability to mine the data re and retrieve that data simply and easily and have the data that is stored in the system in a common format so that you can quickly go in and and get everything back and be able to audit the data that you're actually capturing. Um, and the ability to log everything that happens within the system within some form of encrypted audit trail and ensuring you're compliant with all the different regulations by doing that. And some other things that probably need to be considered are the ability and making considerations, I guess, uh, for all data protection laws such as GDPR in Europe and I'm sure lots of other regulations around the world. Uh, but for example, if you're storing personal data within a within a within an open integration platform, then you must make considerations, for example, for the right in GDPR, the right to be forgotten and the ability to retrieve all the data that you store on a person if that should be requested. So data, data capture and data output are some of the things that are not always considered early in the design process, but really should be heavily thought about because without these, it's actually difficult to decide how everything else is going to link together. And it does impinge on a lot of decisions further down the line. So once we've um, decided the data outputs then we can decide what technology we're going to integrate into the system to feed that data collection ecosystem so here are some of the technologies that you might see integrated within an airport environment so if we look to traditional um, technology such as the safety and security side so inside the terminal we would expect to in integrate with fire intruder cctv access control emergency call points uh, escalators, lift management, building management, etc. And outside the terminal, the the usual of perimeter, but now looking at more drone detection systems and um, yeah, other things like that. Um, but then, obviously, again, thinking a little bit away from security because that's not what these kind of systems are all about. You can start to look at the communication systems, as we've already heard from Zenitel. Um, but also the third party systems such as the slot management, the incident management, the ticketing systems, um, looking at where you actually store all of your data. So from an infrastructure point of view, looking at all the cyber integrations that are possible and the data center integrations relating into temperature, monitoring the actual hardware within the data centers and security. What was traditionally security is becoming much more of a um, a management function of, of lots of different areas and not just the security things that we traditionally saw throughout this industry. Um, and some things that are also coming on board, uh, such as augmented reality. If anyone saw my 
uh, last presentation talking about the future of open integration and augmented reality in an airport is something that could really be seen where through the field of a camera you may start to see things like when the camera pans around and sees a flat a plane it may look at the registration and stand that plane is headed to stand five and its next flight is going to Las Vegas or wherever that may be. So putting things like that and the baggage trolley data, so looking at a baggage trolley with the serial number, which stand it's headed for, et cetera, being able to put that data and enhance the capability of augmented reality will, will really start to come through in these situations. So now, we know that um, we're going to definitely integrate lots of different technologies within this environment. We need to look at using the best of breed technology whilst, whilst protecting our legacy investments. So what is the best of breed of technology for the purpose? Which legacy systems can be used? So not throwing everything away is, is, has to be the uh, common theme. What are the best new subsystems to use? But rather than just think about the functions of the subsystems let's also think about the integration possibilities so rather than just that has the features that i want what can actually systems like open integration platforms expose from that integration so it's almost a second wave of thinking about not just what the system can do but also what um what the integration possibilities are with that system and here are some of the companies we have integration with listed on this slide. Um, but these are just an example of some of them we have. But one of the things that's key for an end user and a consultant um, is a clear, honest, transparent list of all the integrations that are ready and available out of the box. So if I click here, um, if I just move this across, you guys will just see an example of advances and some of just within our website, some of the over 400 interfaces that we have at advances. And this is completely open for everybody to go look at, fully transparent, um, and everybody can uh, can go look um, at this on the on the website. So, um, yeah. So moving on, when, we, when we're creating partnerships with other manufacturers, in order to write interfaces, we're continuously thinking about these next things. So how can we have continuous interface development with the partner, ensuring increased compatibility and increased availability, using realization of full feature sets, so the ability to extract all the features from the, from the manufacturer's interface or SDK software development kit. Um, and having deeper integration to their hardware and providing, in some instances, redundancy and resilient features out where possible. Um, some other things around efficient project delivery, we're looking how we can work with the business to uh, efficiently deliver projects, have increased collaboration with them to enable new features and new product sets into our integration portfolio earlier how we can save our, uh, the end users and money. So how we can collaboratively work on projects and only ensure we supply the correct, the required software or hardware elements. Um, and then moving on from that, also we're looking now much more outside of the box and being able to, as a manufacturer, provide third party integration and UI development. So being able to looking at the open integration platforms that allow the user to develop their own interfaces um, and other businesses to develop interfaces into the integration platform instead of being fully reliant on the manufacturer. And not many platforms offer this level of customization, but as a demand for integration increases, we'll definitely see more customers wanting the ability to not solely rely on the manufacturer and have the ability to write interfaces and user interface enhancements to that, to that product. So once you've decided what integrations you will want within the project and what, what kind of things you would like to um, integrate with the open integration management system, then it's now time to decide how all of this is going to connect together. So the key for me here is to design all the connectivity considerations in from day one. So always complete a network evaluation. So as I put at the top, the network evaluation should never, you should never assume. Um, because just because we have 
a 10 gig link across from one site to the next does not mean that there aren't other systems consuming that 10 gig link. So rather than just assume that we should always be certain about how everything will connect together. So what types of connectivity will be used within the system? So 3G, 4G, and now 5G, is there any connectivity from there? Or mesh or wireless infrastructure that's currently in place? any fiber optic current um, as we're all used to traditional fiber um, but then on beyond that what is the current network infrastructure and what will need to be expanded upon so some considerations as to we're not dealing with an IT system here so what ne network protocols for high bandwidth management are we going to employ within the network does it need to be a layer two or three network um, what are the network speeds? How do we have one gig links, 10 gig links, 50 gig links? What, what do we have? Do we have some, uh, do we need to start thinking around network segmentation using VLANs, et cetera? Um, and also what resilience um, do we need to add? On the resilience side, um, we certainly should be thinking about how to make the network resilient. If we, if for example, we were to lose 20 cameras for three hours or an intruder panel for two days, does that matter to your business? And once you answer these questions, then you can design the redundancy required in the system from an early stage. And last but not least on connectivity, you should also not forget that there may be some legacy protocols left in place, such as RS232 and 485, and how are you going to ensure that these will still function within the system? So following on from my previous diagram um, and some thoughts on the different types of connectivity, here's an example of how that design for an airport could look. So this was taken from an airport design that we produced in Malaysia. Um, so if you, sorry, skip back. So if you notice how the third party systems at the bottom of the LAN are all connected and where some of them may not directly feed the integration platform, rather feed a subsystem that then feeds the data back, making the systems really truly interconnected. You'll also notice that the redundancy element, which should be fully automated, having hot standby servers and including the ability to propagate data back on a, back to the servers when you have issues or downtime and not require any, any downtime from the system. Everything should be very much automated and self-propagating. But yeah, that gives you an idea of what the network uh, could look like. So once you have all of that in place, that's all wonderful, but quite one of the things that really sometimes does get forgotten is how are we going to secure all of that? So we've got lots of data, uh, we've got lots of um, information moving around between systems. How are we going to secure that data? So depending on the nature of the business, that's really going to define the security level. However, it doesn't mean that it should be overlooked. So just because you're on a large corporate network, it doesn't mean it's secure as you think it is or as much as you require. Um, and the same applies to a very small system. Just because you're a small system doesn't mean you shouldn't secure your network. So there's lots of, lots of different things to consider here. So one of the things is network security. So following basic guidelines, really you should have definitely be thinking about how you're going to protect your network, how you're going to detect issues within the, the network and how you will react. So moving on from that, from put that into a very simple form and some of the things to think about in a very small system into the basic level, how are you going to firewall your system from the outside world? How are you going to, um, even if that's via your own wireless mesh or your own networks, how are you going to filter the traffic that can move around that network, especially when there's wireless technology involved? Um, creating a layered or segmented network to reduce the network related issues that you may face with high bandwidth transmissions. Um, ensuring if you do have any Wi Fi access points, even internally to a control center, that it's secure. So, are you going to use something like the likes of 802.11 as a standard encryption uh, within that within that Wi-Fi point? So even on a basic level, uh, starting to think of some of them things, and then slightly more advanced things when we move up, um, just just examples of, but not limited to such things as MAC address and IP address filtering, port filtering, 
not network segmentation using VLANs uh, for protection between systems and embedding permissions of into VLAN routing and et cetera, et cetera. Maybe enforcing security policies based on segmentation and a whole lot more. Uh, but these are just some of the things that really should be thought about. Um, security is quite often the last thing, but it really does need to be uh, thought about up front. It does really make or break how secure the, you know, you end up making the system at the end, and it's not something that's always simple to bolt on. So, thinking about application security, we should, you know, just consider apps from on a day-to-day -day basis, such as WhatsApp. So they WhatsApp encrypts their data end to end, so all of your calls that you use on WhatsApp and all of the the kind of messages that are sent are encrypted end to end, and therefore uh, it's fairly a fairly safe application to use. However, if you think about new apps that have become very big uh, during the UK lockdown, such as the app House Party, I believe the app was hacked within days or even hours. Um, so you've got to translate that into your environment and the application uh, so do you need end-to-end -end encryption or do you just need to secure the data in the control room but what data information or information is being passed out onto the external network is it just ptz data or is it quite sensitive data could anyone exploit that data if they were to gain access and yeah just another thing to consider really so what what do you need to protect um, and then the next thing to think about is what kind of encryption levels are required. So encryption, think about encryption. Do we need to use encryption that's industry standard or should we look for manufacturers that are developing their own standards? I'm not sure this is quite a big, a big argument that goes around the industry, but ultimately I think using the industry standard uh, encryption methods is by far the best way. You may have heard of things such as DES, data encryption standard, and although this is now really obsolete, um, there are this has now really been surpassed by the likes of AES 256 or RSA based encryption. And both have slightly different purposes, but both are kind of NIST approved. Um, and you know, they kind of have the the kind of regulatory bodies behind them that that allow you to have end-to-end -end safe end-to-end -end encryption within uh, within the application, and you should look for an application that does have security provided. And all of these above questions definitely need to be answered as early as possible. So the other thing to consider is adoption of standards. So there are lots of standards floating around the industry. One of the latest standards to emerge. Uh, for, with the, from the introduction by the CPNI is the CAPS approval for uh, different types of platforms, including access control, CCTV, and open integration. So there are different standards certainly appearing to ensure that you buy a product that is secure and well put together, and the uh, development standards are up to scratch, etc. All of that being said, basically discussing and planning this from day one is absolutely essential. So really coming towards the end, but the manufacturer should also be a decision point when purchasing an open integration platform. So thinking, speaking to the manufacturer potentially around the product roadmap, around having an open platform, about be how they implement new functions around how they implement new interfaces, their vendor neutrality and how that will affect your purchase, and also the continuous improvement um, that the company is making. So one of my top tips is don't be scared to ask questions of the manufacturer. Um, I think some people don't want to delve into what the manufacturer does and how they work. But some of the simple things that you can speak to manufacturers around are, does the manufacturer have a product roadmap and what does that roadmap look like? Does it suit your requirements moving forward? Is the manufacturer truly an agnostic manufacturer? So does the company manufacture other competitive technologies such as cameras, access control, recording platforms, intruder panels, access, con uh, yeah, access control panels, et cetera. Um, a manufacturer that is truly agnostic generally has the best interest in ensuring that the integrations to the other OEM platforms are the best they can be as they don't have any competitive technology. So what is their software continual improvement plan? 
So do they have a team dedicated, for example, to ensure that integrations to other manufacturers are up to date? Um, and investigating features of new integrations, do they continuously look for new new features coming out and new different types of integrations? And how are they dealing with the other manufacturers and what is their partnership program looking like? Are they looking at simplifying the integration process and making it more cost effective for the client and maybe allowing third party integrations? So something else to think about. And the whole person purpose of such, such systems ultimately is not to be locked in at any level so we're always trying to to uh, keep that moving forward so last but not least what benefits does this bring if we get all of this right well we have lots of different subsystems here all speaking with the server so the server will then communicate data out across the network whether it's a LAN or a wireless link whatever that may be out to the surveillance or open integration management platform and that management platform then has the ability to transmit data and speak with multiple different disparate systems and bring all of that data together as well in, as well as pushing data back in you also have the, the ability then to start to look at what data you're putting in so being able to feed the server and feed the data um, into the system to ensure that you're capturing everything that's happening as we discussed earlier in the plan but then ultimately at the end which is what everybody really wants to get to is what data you can get out so as we discussed this deciding what this output is very early is is key and critical to the success at the end of the system uh, installation so some final uh, benefits just a quick list that you're going to get a reduction in training costs so single single simple user interface for event handling gives you one interface to train the operators to use and it controls all of the subsystems so again just a single a single interface to for all the operators to to understand and to use increased compliance full encryption of the audit trails and operator activities and full traceability of all the actions taken you're making it future proof, you're, got, you're aiming for a single system for life. So provided you've looked at, as I said, at the manufacturer, you understand the manufacturer's roadmap and it really suits where you're going with your business as well. So you should never have a need to change the main system again and you should have compatibility with the latest technology. You should have increased situational awareness. So dynamic workflows to assist with event handling and increased ability to produce statistic and reports. And at the end that should give you full operational efficiency so reduction in time time dealing with events reduction in the number of people required to deal with events uh, hence the reduction in cost that richard mentioned at the beginning and a reduction in information exchange due to the both inward bound and outward bound integrations possible so some key takeaways from this presentation just really quickly are Think data and outputs early. Plan your network as well as you possibly can. Ensure security is maintained throughout the design. Protecting your legacy investment. Ensure vendor neutrality where possible. I know it's not always possible, so just ensure where possible the, the, the vendor is as neutral as they can be. And continuous improvement. So ensure that the manufacturer is continually improving and they they will give you a roadmap towards where they're going to be in the next two to three years so firstly thanks to everybody listening and i hope this session uh, was useful thanks to 19 group for working with us to present this and thanks to all the pre other presenters i hope you all stay safe and well and thanks for listening back to you richard thanks alan great so um I'll just facilitate a couple of questions. I'm I'm conscious of time, so um, Tony, if you're um, if you're still there, um, there was a couple yes. of questions jumping back to your presentation. Um, one I think is a common question from when I was uh, when I was a, a system integrator myself, and going back, uh, there's a misconception that when you put IR illumination on a camera, then that will give you uh, exactly what you would get in, in full daylight or ambient light. So what, what is the maximum distance that IR illumination can, can go? 
Oh, that's a, a very good question. And you're, you're quite right in terms of it being a, a common one. And perhaps one of the reasons is because there's no absolute defined answer to that because it really depends on the atmospheric conditions and it depends what you're actually looking at. So the IR illumination needs to reflect off the target, reflect off the scene. So you need good reflection. So it depends what you're looking at in terms of whether it's concrete that's got a good reflection or whether it's, you know, I can't number plates that have a huge reflection coming back. They are going to make a big impact on the distance. You can actually throw the light and actually get a response back from, from the camera. Uh, and again, the atmosphere. So in some conditions, you'll be perfectly OK. But in other times, there'll be a lot of bugs around. Um, there could be fog and mist in, at which point you're just going to light the atmosphere up. So there is no 100 percent answer as to how far uh, it's capable of doing. But we have at 360 Vision certainly done tests where we've got IR illumination easily going over 500 meters in most conditions. But of course, if fog was to was to draw in, then um, that would certainly be limited uh, in terms of yeah. what we do. So uh, unfortunately, not. Uh, no, so it's about it's about fine. making the 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 customer the end user understand those variables and setting the expectation, isn't it? I think that's the that's the important thing. Yeah. Um, so great, just just another one. I know you you obviously you did some great examples of IR illumination and white light, but um, can you provide a bit more detail on what black light is, such as wavelength and give a couple of examples of applications where that would be used uh okay yes uh well black light is really the the terminology i suppose by in reflection ir illumination which is 850 nanometers which is what's typically used uh, for lighting uh, areas up at night because it's relatively covert and i say relatively covert because if you see any cameras of ir illumination the human eye can actually see a red dot where the illuminator is and typically an led so you see this little red glow on cameras and quite typically on a premise you'll see these red dots around and they kind of almost highlight where the cameras actually are well black light is actually taking that um, wavelength slightly further up to 940 nanometers which takes it out of the visual spectrum so when you look at a camera that's got a 940 nanometer uh, IR illumination turned on you see no difference whatsoever so essentially it looks like it's off that is the term that it is black light from a visual point of view as long as the camera has sensitivity up at that range then it's still providing illumination so um, for applications uh, really it's where you want total covert so if I have cameras on a building and I just don't want to have any red dots appearing or in the landscape red dots are appearing from that illumination keeps the surveillance covert but a, another application would be anywhere where you really can't afford to have a red light in terms of safety such as rail for example so any cameras that are going near the rail network um, at night if we can use IR illumination they absolutely cannot have that red glow because obviously it could be mistaken for a stop signal so that would be a, another application excellent thank you tony um so i'll just field a, a question to uh, shell from zenitel shell yes, if you are there. <laughs> yeah. um great yeah so one of the questions was um on a so a critical communication solution like you gave us lots of options of and some use cases how is system monitoring set up within that system well, basically, that, that is a very interesting and important question because system monitoring is very important to ensure that the system is operational at all times. And there are basically two ways we can monitor the system uh, and our devices. That is that we, of course, uh, each device have an IP address. So if they lose connection with the server, for instance, then uh, it will report back to the server that the connection is, is gone. <clears throat> uh so that's that's uh, one uh, option um and the other um the other way of monitoring is to um do something we call tone testing tone testing is really to uh test that the microphone and the speaker is actually functioning properly so what it does is that you can set up uh, a tone that will play from the speaker and then picks up by the microphone again and reports back to the server and all of these reports can also be sent uh, forward to uh, a security management system or a PCM system. Um, so you can have everything monitored from the from the top um, down to our system. 
Great. And, to, and tone testing, for example, that's completely configurable based on whatever the requirements are of the of the application or the end user. That is configurable, yes. So you can set up the tone testing um, uh, on interval basis, uh, meaning that, for instance, uh, once a day or uh, two times a day or whatever you would prefer, um, you would do the tone testing uh, when there's uh, uh, little activity on your site, for instance, mm. uh, to make sure that it doesn't um, interfere with the uh, normal operational business. Yeah. Great. Thank you, Shell. Thank you. So um, that that actually brings. Sorry, we couldn't get through all the questions. Um, we will answer some of those privately to individuals as well. But that brings us to the end of the webinar today. Thanks to our speakers again, and thanks to everyone for attending. Uh, a feedback form will be sent out via email. So really appreciate your feedback, good or bad, so we can improve on on future webinars and events. Uh, all our presenters uh, are on LinkedIn if you want to connect with them. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much. Uh, have a great rest of the day. Stay safe and goodbye.